The last panel of the day is a great panel with some really killer panelists on this. So this one is called Managing Internal Investigations and Advanced Government Defense. And we have a great moderator, Leslie Caldwell. Uh, Leslie's a partner at Latham & Watkins. She was our keynote speaker in 2016 when she was Assistant Attorney General of the DO's, DOJ's Criminal Division. Uh, but Leslie's illustrious career as a prosecutor also includes time as an AUSA in both the Eastern District of New York and the Northern District of California, as well as being head of the Enron Task Force. Uh, thank you for being here, Leslie. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. To Leslie's left is Phil Kinda. Uh, Phil's a partner at Ked Waller, also a veteran of the SEC's Enforcement Division. He's one of the top advisors to public companies and corporate boards when it comes to matters such as internal investigations. And he's led uh, huge investigations such as the CalPERS Special Review that dealt with pay to play and public corruption. Uh, one extraordinary item from Phil's bio, I've read this more than once, and it continues to be true, I keep checking. No corporation or individual that he's ever rep represented from the outset of an investigation has ever been sued by the SEC or indicted. Nice. It's true. Phil, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. To Phil's left is Wilson Leung. He's Director of Corporate Legal Investigations <clears throat> for Intel. Uh, he previously served as an AUSA both in the Southern District and the Northern District of, Southern District of New York, I should say, and Northern District of California. Welcome, Wilson. Thanks. Uh, to Wilson's left, we have Tracy Davis. Sorry. Uh, Tracy's Assistant Regional Director in the SEC's San Francisco office. She joined the SEC in 2002 and has led many of the agency's high-profile investigations into FCPA violations uh, and has been a, a guest at this conference many times and a panelist so many times. Thank you. Tracy, Thanks for welcome. Me. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Josh Rusenko, a director in KPMG's forensics practice based in Silicon Valley. Josh has overseen numerous internal investigations and post-resolution corporate monitor monitorships, and he regularly advises clients on designing and implementing effective investigations programs. Thanks for joining us, Josh. Thanks. All right, one more panel. Let's make it okay. great. Okay. <laughs> no pressure. By the way, I can't make the same claim that Philip can about my clients never being uh, sued, investigated, prosecuted, convicted, sent to jail. Um, <laughs> only one jail. Anyway, we have, two, we have a lot to talk about. We have two, really kind of two topics um, that are obviously overlapping and interrelated, but not always, and that is um, internal investigations and government investigations. Um, so I think I'd like to start with asking about internal investigations where the company is going to be doing an investigation with no government in the picture. So the government is either unaware or uninterested, probably unaware of the allegation. So, um, and I'm going to start with you, um, Wilson. Uh, I'm sure that, like any company, you get all sorts of different allegations from all sorts of different sources with varying degrees of specificity and plausibility. How do you decide? when something that comes across your transom is something that needs to be investigated? As a general matter, we intake everything and we investigate everything, right? But, um, but obviously, I think what, what's meant here is when we fully investigate, bring an outside counsel and, and do the full nine yards. And that's largely based on the perceived risk. Risk in turn is a function of the type of allegation. Um, does it allege a statutory violation of the law? Would it likely interest um, an external party, notably a government regulator, is there some sort of um, is there some sort of operational consequence, reputational harm to the company if the allegation is proven true? And in those higher risk circumstances, we would certainly initiate a deep investigation, likely bring in outside counsel and other experts to help us out as well. We would serve as a triaging function and a coordinating function, but in circumstances like that, we would seek external assistance. And how do you decide in a particular matter who's going to actually oversee um, the investigation? In other words, is it going to be overseen by the legal department, compliance, the board, a board committee? It, how do you decide that? It's usually, again, it, it is largely risk dependent. Um, I think, uh, it, in my experience, it's typically handled within compliance um, with a direct line to the GC and the audit committee unless there's some need for a deviation from the standard practice. So, Philip, what is your view on at what point um, in-house counsel should bring in outside counsel? Well, I would say 
when should they consult? Anytime you feel it's not plain vanilla, don't wait for the rocky road. The minute it feels French <laughs> vanilla to you, pick up the phone. And I'm never, never reluctant to say, listen, I hear your concern. Here's how I would wade in. It's about reasonableness and line drawing. And to my mind, just a really one thought on approach, and, and I will submit to you, uh, if you remember only one thing from today, maybe remember this, which is in any investigation, always think of the very end from the very beginning. Always. Let that guide you. Where do you want to be when this is done? Not on the steps of a courthouse, next to an accomplished trial lawyer saying how delighted you are by the appellate court's decision. <laughs> You'd rather be at a cocktail party with me three years from now, and when the board member or officer is asked whatever happened to that horrible thing, they get to smile and say it went away. But how do you do that? Again, you think of the very end, a result that will stand the test of time. And so it's about process. And so more often than not, people will wade in and you know, follow the facts, and it's this, this, or that. That's true as to fact finding. But in terms of process, you think at the end, what is it we want to have? What record do we want to have? So that when the government does call in, come calling, if they do, we can say, we thought of that. Or what more would you have had us you know, look at so that you're comfortable? Um, in terms of who runs it, I mean, my thought on that is, if it goes to management integrity, then we have to look outside, right? If it, if, however, I'm, I'm a big believer in giving management the chance to run with it. Um, and I said this on behalf of the CalPERS folks, you know, uh, you may think I'm biased, but I'm not wrong. And tell me where I pulled my punches. So those are my thoughts from the beginning. Always think of the very end and, and have at us in terms of stumping us on how one thinks is long ahead in terms of the report, in terms of the product, in terms of the outcome. That's the key more than anything else. So I promised myself that I, if I was still talking about the Enron case 20 years on, I needed to just go do something else. But since Bruce brought it up, um, I know that one of the things in the Enron case, one of the things that the Enron case really spawned was a practice of requiring independent outside counsel to do an investigation, meaning outside counsel who did either little or preferably zero work um, for the client and on the theory that they would be unbiased. And um, it arose from the law firm that Enron hired to do an investigation that ended up, I think, something like 20% of their billings were attributable to Enron. So mm -hmm. that seems to have changed. But I think, um, let me ask you, Tracy, does the SEC, what, does the, what are the SEC's expectations? And I realize you can't speak for the entire SEC, but what are your expectations when a company is hiring outside counsel to do an investigation in terms of whether they need to be independent? So first, good news. This is the last time you'll hear this today. <laughs> uh, the views I express today are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of the commission or any of its staff. Um, so with that, I would say, you know, we look at really um, what, not so much whether they hired outside independent counsel or not. We really look at um, what have they done and can we, do we really see legitimacy in the investigations they're conducting? So let's say they used, um, let's say they used in either you know, their legal department, um, based on the information they're providing to us, we're gonna kick the tires and we're gonna see, you know, is the information you're providing to us, does it sound like, um, regardless of who did the investigation, whether it's thorough, whether it's, um, objectively uncovering the information. Um, so I don't really look at whether or not they hire outside independent counsel. We prefer it, right? I mean, it's, it's better in the sense that, you know, it may lend some kind of legitimacy, but the truth is you can have outside counsel that also doesn't do a great job. You mm -hmm. just, it doesn't, so in that scenario, we're gonna kick the tires anyway, whether you used inside counsel or outside counsel. One thought I might add to that, Leslie, is Think of independence as a proxy for something more important, and that's intellectual integrity. It, it's hard to legislate that, just like in you know independent public accountant. How do you say we want a really good accountant? And so the, the presumption is that someone independent will call it like they see it. It doesn't, as you suggest, it doesn't always mean they're good. And so when you are on behalf of management and are in theory not independent, what you say to them is, but look at how I'm doing this. And I think that's the more important thing, intellectual integrity, rigor. Okay. 
So when you, you have an, Winston, you have an alligator, I'm sorry, Wilson, I, I, I apologize, I keep, call, I keep calling <laughs> Wilson by another friend's name. Mutual friend. Um, <laughs> Great guy. So <laughs> what do you do? These, these things can quickly spread like wildfire within a company about the fact that there's some kind of an allegation and investigation. How do you, what's your strategy for communicating and who do you feel like you need to communicate to within the company when something like this happens? I think, depending on, on the nature of the allegation, I think the, the first step is to a, uh, ensure that um, hopefully the company, in the abstract, I'm not talking about any particular company I may have worked for, but I think hopefully the, the company has a culture where internal investigations are not considered um, a, a persecution or somehow a, an extraordinary process where there are uh, where it's an attempt to to persecute people or to scapegoat people, and once an investigation begins, it's important to to build on that base to make sure that the process is viewed internally by employees as legitimate. And after that, it's important to cabin the investigation to those who need to know. Um, obviously, witnesses have to be advised that uh, have to be advised concerning. Um, preservation orders, and uh, and that they will be contacted likely by outside counsel or someone um, in the who, who is independent, but who will be doing a thorough investigation. Um, and I think it starts from there. And the goal is to make sure that the investigation doesn't cause panic. I think that's uh, a particularly important um, goal for for in-house counsel to keep in mind because the investigations are disruptive and they do often freak people out. Yeah, okay. Do you think it matters whether, do, do employees react differently in your experience to um, being interviewed by in-house counsel versus outside counsel? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, there's there's a perception that in-house counsel is, is friendlier, is aligned with their interests. Outside counsel um, is a stranger um, and there's also the, the misperception that they are outsiders who are seeking to essentially pin blame on someone within the company. That's happened in the past. Um, I think oftentimes outside counsel has to overcome that initial reaction from employees. And it, it helps to have great bedside manner as outside counsel. Um, but sometimes uh, being, being nice can only get you so far in an investigation. So Philip, let me ask you, let's, let's, some companies obviously some issues have to be disclosed in an SEC filing or otherwise, but a lot of issues don't have to be disclosed. There's no obligation for public disclosure. Mm -hmm. What advice do you give a client when they're trying to decide whether they should say something publicly, um, either through a PR firm or in a press release or something about whatever's happening? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the answer has always remained the same as more folks have come into this. It's the same way that when they receive a subpoena, is a subpoena a disclosable thing? I still believe the answer to that in and of itself is no. It's the underlying materiality of the issue that should drive the analysis. And so if we believe there is a material event here, not the possibility of a material event, but do we have a material event, that's when we talk about it. My view would be until we for sure cross that line, let's get as far as we can along in getting our arms around this. And I like to say, I prefer not to tell the story until it has a happy ending. <laughs> um, and so if we can get through to the end such that when you do disclose, you can say resources were committed to investigating this and a determination was made this, this, and that. That's not always the case. And, and when you have to, then to my mind, do not say anything qualitative or predictive because you're just going to be wrong. It should just be um, management is investigating or a committee of the board is investigating this. We've committed the resources we believe are necessary. We've engaged advisors. We are in touch with the government as appropriate. Because if you do it the way you may remember AOL did, where the, you know, no fraud, we think it's five million, this duty to update and correct just overtakes the whole thing. Yeah, and I, I think that's one thing that I found to be particularly problematic with uh, younger companies, newer companies that don't have haven't had these experiences before. There's an instinct for somebody to speak up, for the CEO to say something. And oftentimes they'll say something that is what, like what Philip just said. Nothing was, no one did anything wrong. I have total confidence. Andy Fastow, going back to Enron again, this is the second time I'm doing it, and the last. Um, the Enron announced that they had complete confidence in Andy Fastow like two weeks before he was fired. Um, 
So you just have to be really careful about that. So uh, one of the really important things that I know probably everyone here spends a decent amount of energy on is making sure that these investigations are under the attorney-client privilege and that they stay privileged. So Josh, at what point does the auditor expect to know about an investigation and what do you, what do you expect to be told? Yeah, I mean, there's many ways that this discussion can start up. So I think, you know, the probably the rarest, hopefully, way is when the auditor discovers it, um, you know, through its own procedures. So under, you know, Section 10A of the 34 Act, uh, the auditor has a requirement to evaluate whether or not, you know, an event was likely to have occurred. They'll raise it to management, and then they will let management proceed with the investigation. Um, and only in the case that they're not satisfied with it may they then be required to speak to the SEC. So this is a process which doesn't occur a lot, but when the auditor is the originator of the hit or the tip, um, you know, that's gonna be something where it's gonna go straight to management, right? And there's not gonna be sort of the normal process. Um, what's more tricky is when you have something that sort of percolates internally as a regular hotline matter, something like that. Um, and you know, for the most part, the auditors will generally be aware of you know the audit committee and its processes for monitoring the hotline. It may actually be you know something that you would that they would be aware of in a just purely factual way. Um, when you actually are at that stage where you have to decide whether to share information with them, it's really important to understand in the agreement with the auditors like what exactly are the confidentiality provisions in there. Um, you know, you have to understand what are the protections for both you and them. Um, and then, you know, secondly, privilege review is just incredibly critical, right? Having counsel look and say, all right, is this in anticipation of litigation? Is this going to be something that's just attorney-client privilege? Because, you know, depending on, you know, the status of the privilege, you may waive uh, privilege for sharing certain documents. And generally, as long as you're working with the auditors and letting them know the limitations of what can be shared, uh, keeping things very factual, every time they give a request for you know, what it is that you're doing, you know, clarify if you have any confusion. Don't over-provide information, but also don't not answer the question. Um, and it should be something that most uh, you know, audit firms should be familiar with. And they'll actually have a specialist shadow team that will know how to do investigations and will work closely with those those people. So, um, you know, that would be generally the, the best outcome. So, Philip, I'll just ask you if you've had an experience where um, the company's auditor has kind of wanted to conduct its own separate investigation or maybe check your work. Uh, the How latter. Can you handle that? The latter <laughs> every time. Mm -hmm. uh, the former, luckily, no. But it, it's one of the most underappreciated risks, I would say, mm -hmm. is. A well-intended auditor will say, can you just show me this, this, and that? And remember, their independence mm -hmm. and their, their public watchdog function defeats any claim of privilege, confidentiality. Now, I have a rule. You never surprise the auditor. You never surprise the board. Because surprise can masquerade as crisis, and that's bad. But when they say, can we see your keywords? Can we see this? Can we see that? It's In many respects, it's the same thing I would say to you, Tracy. Just tell me what you want to know, mm -hmm. right? For example, what I might say is, well, you know, as to the CFO, we read every email, every single one. And we found this one. And this one says 0 .01 question mark. And it's the penny they found to make earnings. And I don't know what keyword would have found that, but we found that. And, and that's the kind of thing you have to be careful about because if they invade upon the privilege, you lose. And so it's, it's managing that information flow because it's the company that'll have a 13A problem, right? If, if you defeat their independence, you, the company, now have filings that will not be reviewed by an independent public accountant. They don't want that, but you don't want that. And so it's managing their understanding of that boundary, right? Mm -hmm. I'll get you the substance of whatever you want, but I have to find a way to do it mm -hmm. that doesn't put you in a bad spot, put us in a bad spot. That's the dance. So... Just jumping ahead a little bit now, you've, you've, so you've done an investigation, you see that there has been a problem, there has been some kind of a violation of the law, um, either a securities law or some other law. You come to one of the hardest decisions that I think in-house counsel ever has to make and the board and management ever has to make, which is, what do you do about that? Do you tell, do you self-report, do you self-disclose? Um, and Winston, I'll start with you. Or Wilson, I'm sorry, I did it again. Um, what, what's, 
and I don't mean to ask about your particular company, but what, what's the, in the calculus for a company when it's deciding whether it needs to self-report something that it's not legally required to report? If it's not legally required, it would be, gosh, that, that would be a hard judgment call, right, depending on the perceived risk likelihood of um, some sort of independent disclosure and, uh, and, and severity of any outcomes if it is somehow disclosed, right? So that is a difficult question to answer in the abstract, but those are some of the considerations. Obviously, you have to run it up the chain in any sort of decent corporation, but um, we would, in that situation, rely heavily on outside counsel for their judgment. And Tracy, what are your expectations about whether and when a company should self-report, let's say, a violation of the securities laws? Immediately. <laughs> so I know my predecessor in the criminal division, Lanny Brewer, said, as soon as you get the hotline report, I want you on the phone to me. And I, I, hopefully that's not what you're saying. In many ways, yes, because here's the, here's the issue. I mean, we've had, we've had investigations where, you know, outside counsel or the company has been investigating it for like eight months before they come to us. And by the time they come to us, People have resigned or they've left the company. We don't have access to them. There wasn't a document preservation in place. So, you know, phones are no longer available or information on phones are no longer available. Emails have been deleted. Um, and so evidence gets lost um, during that process of delay. The other thing that happens is, right, memories never get better. So while a company takes eight months, you know, to finally come to us and then we start an investigation, and then we you know, subpoena documents from the company, and then they say it's going to take them you know, four months to produce them. Now we're up to a year. Um, by the time we start talking to people, you know, people don't recall those conversations. So it is difficult for us when a company waits to, um, to self-report. And I've had companies that have self-reported and said, look, we don't know if there's anything there. We're, we're looking into it. It's very early. We're going to do an investigation, but we just wanted you to know that we're looking into it. And on some of those occasions, right, nothing, you know, it turns out that there's, there's no violation, right? They, they say, look, okay, we've looked into it. It's taken us six months. But they give us updates, like, like status updates along the way. But at least we know that they've looked into it or that they're looking into it. Um, and then there's not the risk that, right, some whistleblower comes to us before they do because that becomes a problem for us um, if in the eight months that they're looking into it because as they talk to witnesses and interview witnesses, someone raises their hand and they send in a, you know, a tip or complaint to the SEC. And would you hold that against the company in assessing its, um, the way it handled the, the investigation if, let's say, they were doing an internal investigation but hadn't alerted you and you got a whistleblower letter? So we wouldn't hold it against them, but we wouldn't give them credit for self-reporting, right? So okay. that's, how, that's how that would, would work. And then in terms of you know, just cooperation in general, if it turns out that during that time you know, evidence was lost, information you know, wasn't available to us, witnesses weren't available to us, again, that just goes into the calculation of cooperation. But, I wouldn't, but there's a lot of factors, right, that you take into consideration for cooperation. So that's just one of many that okay. would be considered. Philip, do you have anything to say about that when you're, when you're counseling a client about whether they should self-disclose something? What do you factor in and when do you think they should do it? Yeah, there are a lot of variables here. This is one of the hardest questions. And so I think what you know, Tracy and Wilson both said, do I think there's a whistleblower? Do I think there's another player on the field? Do I think the board is going to, you know, a business partner, what have you? Um, how soon can I tell, and we develop a kind of an instinct about this, that this is going to go far enough that there is going to be something there. That's when I pick up the phone and I say, look, we're on top of this. Here are the resources we've committed to it. Here's where we're going. I would love to put that off as long as I can, right? If I can get to a happy ending before there, sure. But if I'm not certain, um, I lay the risk out. You know, I would be unhappy if I was asked on behalf of a board to look over management and say, I mean, the, the first thing you have to do is information lockdown. Like, how do you ever let anything get away? Documents should never get away. That's step one. And so in terms of people, that can be trickier. But that's the, the surest thing you can say to the government is, we didn't call you, but it's all right here frozen in time waiting for you. Um, I've had good success. Each one of these is kind of bespoke, um, where you do call and you say, and part of this is also, is there anything else going on with the government, by the way? Are we being investigated for something else? 
because it can't be that they learn around the way that there was something else. And so all of that factors into it. Um, I would just say, at the very last moment that we can, credibly, because once my credibility is gone, my ability to be the good ambassador for the, en the entity, that shows over. Josh, does the auditor want to know before a self-report is made? Um, they're going to want to have assurance that the process is working right. So again, it's going to be a very complicated calculus that they're mm -hmm. going to go through. Um, they don't want to um, force themselves into a privileged ongoing situation. Um, but if you don't have clear communication with them throughout the process, it could cause a delay in a 10Q issuance if you surprise them at the very end of the process. So typically, um, you know, again, getting back to the concept of there are facts, um, there is something going on. Um, that's going to be the kind of thing that they will work with you through and just let them know there's a plan, that it's structured, that you're focused on, you know, the nexus of activity with some kind of violation, giving them that comfort, right, that there's something in progress and you're making uh, motions towards it. That's really the kind of thing that's, I think, going to be very valuable. That said, the field of play is changing and there's a lot of many uh, new causes of action Right, some of which they may be responsible for, some of which they may not be. Right, and there's issues around product safety, ESG, things that we talked about earlier today. And again, I think educating them is, you know, probably one of the best ways to get started to to make sure they're not more alarmed than they should be. So, Tracy, let me ask you: um, if a company does decide to self-report something and they come meet with you, and let's just take an, an example that I think is probably fairly common in companies and that's in the FCPA space. A lot of times companies have allegations from all over the world, global companies in particular, um, about supposed FCPA violations or supposed bribery or, or other inappropriate behavior. They investigate them, they conclude that either there's nothing there or it's unclear or maybe there is something but they fire the people and, and um, impose new compliance restrictions or the like. What do you expect to hear? Like if, if they've just investigated country A and in the past three years, they did countries B through Z. Do you expect to hear about B through Z? It depends on the severity of the conduct in B through Z. Uh -huh. So if, and, and quite frankly, how large um, maybe their operations are in B through Z. So maybe, maybe um, in country number four, it was you know, one allegation of a $1,000 payment um, but they looked into it and they, and let's say they do, I'm making this up, you know, right, 50 or a billion dollars in revenue in that one subsidiary, and we're talking about a thousand dollar payment. Um, and they said, look, we looked into it, we couldn't really make heads or tails of it, but it was an allegation we received. That, from us, is going to get, at least in my opinion, is going to get, a, okay, thank you for telling us about it, as opposed to, okay, now go and, you know, investigate thoroughly this, you know, other issues in this country based on this one. But we're going to want to know, what did you do um, to look into the conduct? Um, and particular FCPA investigations are slightly different because, or in my mind, they're slightly different because you're talking about, um, because you can have so many operations in so many different countries. Um, if you're talking about, like I said, one $1,000 payment versus, um, look, there have been allegations about you know fifteen transactions and told you know connected to this transact these fifteen transactions. There's maybe you know potential of you know two hundred million dollars in revenue, right? So we would want you to look at those. If you're telling me that it's one one you know allegation of one payment of a thousand dollars, we understand that the resources looking into that may not justify that. But we are going to want the com company to explain to us what have you looked at just generally and just give us a high level. So Philip, what's your view of that, that level of disclosure? Um, yeah, that sounds right to me. I, you know, the thing that occurred to me as you were explaining that, Tracy, is I, I'm also a big believer in making sure the home country regulator knows. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm on behalf, if the Americans are looking at a European-based multinational, I will often visit upon the European regulator to say, it has to be a meaningful investigation, mind you, that I think is going to go somewhere. I will make sure they know the Americans are looking. The reverse is true, that if somehow the UK, the Serious Fraud Office, is looking at something at a US entity, we will visit upon 
the right U.S. authority to say, just so you know. Um, and I try to give them a look at what we're doing without overpromising, as a way of teasing also out from the regulators, is there anything else you'd like us to look at? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're hunting anyway. What is it you want? What is it you, you expect? A little bit of buy-in doesn't hurt. And how do you get the information to the regulators without, for example, waiving the attorney-client privilege? For example, DOJ has said very strongly that they expect to see um, if a company is going to get cooperation credit, they expect that it will provide all non-privileged information about anyone involved in any, mis any misconduct. Um, if, you're, if you're having to meet that threshold, how do you do it without giving up the store? Um, often what I tell them is, listen, I'm happy to get you everything you want. And it's not that I don't trust you. It's that there's you know, an angry mob of plaintiff lawyers out there <laughs> And if I go too far with you, I create this entire new flank that I've got to deal with, and it just doesn't end, and all it does is hurt the company and their shareholders. And so if I see measured, it's not that I don't want to get it to you, it's that I have to fashion a way, just like I do with the auditors, to get, I promise you, you will get the substance of what you want. I just want to do it in such a way that doesn't necessarily leave a trail or just paint a target on everybody. That's the dance. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's talk for a few minutes about the opposite scenario where the company doesn't know about a potential issue until the government comes calling. Um, how does that, Wilson, when you get that subpoena or request from the SEC or the DOJ about something that you had no idea about, what do you do? That immediately triggers DEF CON 5, right? <laughs> because when, whenever we get something external, um, it, it it gets prioritized, and we would, of course, likely hire outside counsel to to handle the work. Um, obviously, uh, because of the fact that governmental scrutiny tends to be a bit deeper than our in internal scrutiny. Um, e even if the best outcome is we find nothing wrong, as Tracy pointed out, the government will kick the tires a lot more. We, we have to work harder to prove the negative that there's nothing to this. Um, and that's... And that's the best outcome, right? The worst outcome is that there's something there. So uh, it all heightens the risk and heightens the stakes for us. So as a result, um, we get outside counsel involved early and deeply. And how does that, how does the fact of an SEC or DOJ outreach to your client before you, before the client knew of a problem, how does that affect how you handle the investigation, Philip, if it does? Well, if, if the government kind of comes in hot, you know, often you like to say, listen, I, I just reviewed the request. It seems like a traffic stop. You know, let's just handle this. Let's just be cool, get them what they want. Hopefully we move along. This one is not that, right? This one, I sense almost a bit of disappointment, anger, concern. Let's get in there as quickly as we can and just, look, we're here to help. We're here to understand. And um, we'd love to know how you know, but understand we're committing now there's no way that the company is going to defend something that's wrong. We just want to understand it first. And so if you can help us, that'd be great. And all we can do is pledge our ability to pursue it with you. And they may not want that, but it's, it's, again, it's bringing to bear your credibility and the resources because where you do have an advantage is as mighty as the government is, you know, I can have 50 people there tomorrow and we can really start rolling and we can lock down documents and we can really start making good. You know, I talk it, you know, I'll roll the Ferrari off the lot and hit the racetrack and I'll catch up pretty quick. Um, but that's sometimes what you have to do when you learn late and you just do the best you can to catch up. And uh, I've had good success with that, but it's, it's tricky in the early going, especially when the government comes in, they come in angry. One that happens to come to mind is they had done an initial review and the agent there were two individuals who had the same initials, and they had transposed them in doing their little field interviews mm -hmm. and misunderstood it, and holy cow, they were mad. I mean, mad. And, and that there had been an initial contact with somebody in the compliance department at the company, and the, 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 the misrepresentations had been made, when in fact they were truthful, but the names had been tra transposed. And so diffusing that, but that initial meeting, wow, not happy. So Tracy, um, I know that, obviously, when companies do get a subpoena from the SEC, they want to do an investigation. They want to have an internal 
review, they want to interview people, look at documents. What's the SEC's, how do you deal with that? Because obviously, do you stand down and wait, or how do you decide what to do? There was a time when, when we would give companies probably more time to look into the issues first. Now, because it takes, often it takes companies a long time to do that. And so initially, and again, depending on what the allegations are, right, that also impacts whether you're going to give them time, the company time to look into it. But, you know, let's say the company, let's say it's a sort of a smallish type issue that's not terribly complicated, and the company says, look, we're going to take a look at this, and then we'll report back to you what we find. We're more likely to give them time to do that than um, a situation when it, you know it's a complicated issue from the very beginning, you know there are a lot of people involved, and you know it's going to take a long time. Um, and so in those situations, and it depends on whether we, we have information that suggests there's something there, right? So if it comes in to us as a whistleblower complaint with some really specific allegations of wrongdoing, we're less likely to give the company you know, six months, eight months to look into it because it's delaying our investigation. Um, and so my inclination is usually to give the company a little time um, to you know, collect documents. Sometimes they want to interview the witnesses. Um, but generally, if it takes more than a couple months for them to collect all those documents, interview those witnesses, I've had times where I've just told them, look, we'd, we'd like to talk to these people, and we, we really can't wait anymore. Um, so, Philip, what do you do if you're in a situation where the SEC wants to talk to people who you haven't spoken to yet? Um, I would urge them to give me a chance. Because and they said no. And they said no. <laughs> well, then I would say, you know, what's going to happen is I'm going to end up talking to them anyway, right after. And are you going to, what if I learn more than apparently you learned? We're going to have this cross rough where maybe I know more than you. And I don't think you want that. I don't want that either. If you give me a chance to go first. But again, if, if people are, you know, locked in, I'm still going to talk to them afterwards. It's, it's happened. Um, it's happened where an international regulator says, we don't want you talking to anybody. And justice says, how have you not talked to these people? Mm -hmm. uh, you have to balance it. I'm going to end up talking to everybody. And usually, I have, again, the pandemic has made things a little funny. But I can be on site the next day with as many people as I need. I can catch up pretty quickly. And I will have access, resources. Often, I know the business better. Um, if I can't catch up to be a credible partner, because that's really the idea that you're, the, the vibe you're going for is, we're here to help. Because you perceive wrongdoing. If we do too, we want to stop it the day we find it, build a wall around it, put that in the past, and move forward. And if we can do that credibly with you, I think that gets us more time. Um, but if something has led you to believe that's not credible, like you've got a whistleblower who said, Whatever you do, don't believe the general counsel. Or whatever you do, don't believe you know, the chief internal auditor. The more I learn about that, you know, the more I'd say, well, then maybe a board committee's got to step in, but we've got to get rolling. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I mean, and, I, and you know, Gabir talked about this today during his speech. I mean, you know, enforcement and the commission really want investigations to move quickly. Um, and in a situation where you say you can you know, move quickly, you can get in there, you can get the documents, you can interview witnesses, that might be fine. The problem comes when you have the, the outside counsel or maybe the companies doing the investigation where it's five, six months later. It's really taking them a long time to collect the documents, to interview the witnesses, and that's when it becomes problematic. We just can't stand down for, you know, six months. Yeah, it shouldn't take that long. Do you expect the company to um, give you a heads up if they're planning on taking personnel action against people who are involved in whatever the misconduct is? Um, what we tell them is um, the personnel decisions they make are their own. The commission does not take a position on those. It would be helpful to us, though, if they gave us a heads up, because sometimes we would like to potentially reach out to those individuals and interview them before they're, for example, removed from the company. Um, but sometimes companies have told us, look, for X, Y, and Z reasons, we really have to remove them. And that's just what it is. We, we, we don't take a position on that. So I, I want to call you out a little bit on that, if I may. Sure. 
So, so I had an investigation where the first thing the staff told me, I took over for another law firm, and they said, how does so-and-so still work at the company? And I said, well, I would have been inclined to shoot him day of arrival, but I had a feeling that, one, I wanted to talk to him, and you hadn't taken his testimony yet, and I felt like pretty confident that if I did that, he takes the fifth, and you never see him again. And as mad as you are now, you'd be madder then. But it, I really felt like I never got credit for that. And that, that was a tricky <laughs> one. You know, that, that it's, it's, it's just one of those things that's idiosyncratic. You kind of can't win, but I still think that's the right call. Yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't represent every staff person of the SEC, right? And so each situation is, is different. And so, um, but I will, I will say that in, in my investigation and in my experience, um, it really is, you know, and again, even I've had investigations where there was an ongoing fraud. Like we knew that there, but we can't force a company to remove someone. Mm -hmm. um, we have to let the company do whatever the company's going to do. Sure. But we definitely take that into account when we get to the end of our investigation and we say, look, you were aware that there was a fraud going on. We were all aware. Right. But that's, it's up to the company. No, well, that's the, that's the opposite problem. I've already put the person in a box. They sit in a fishbowl all day. <laughs> It's that if I fire them, nobody ever sees them right. again, and they're into the wind, and that's the yeah. part that concerns me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. a lot of times when the SEC wants to interview or the DOJ wants to interview employees, the company will arrange for them to have counsel, sometimes their own counsel, sometimes pool counsel, who will represent a bunch of different employees. Um, Philip, when you're in that situation, do you enter into any kind of joint defense or common interest agreements with counsel for those employees? I, so two things I would say. One, if I represent a company and we're going to jointly represent any individual, I always get them someone to serve as their individual counsel also, someone they can talk to on their own. So I am never their primary lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have a written common interest agreement. Well, you know, we have an understanding. But the minute we diverge, then they're on their own. Um, I, I don't think having, and part of this goes back to there was a time when certain offices of the SEC would start asking in testimony, do you have a joint defense agreement? Mm -hmm. Do you have a written joint defense agreement? Which begets then the idea that, well, no, no, we don't have a written joint defense agreement. We just have you know, an understanding. Um, so generally, I don't. In litigation, you might. In securities mm -hmm. litigation, you see that all the time. But in government investigations, my practice is really to just to have a very clear, you know, uh, understanding, again, this is the same way we deal with the government. We deal with each other credibly. If I can't rely on you and you can't rely on me, we've got much bigger problems. Mm -hmm. So, Tracy, again, realizing that you don't speak for the entire SEC or even any of the SEC except for your own views, um, what is your view of joint defense agreements, common interest agreements between a company and employees who may be involved in wrongdoing? To the extent that that that, that impacts our investigation, um, which I, and I've seen many times in which it does, mm -hmm. um, and it impedes our investigation, then we absolutely take that into account. But again, we can't, you know, people choose their counsel, people make whatever agreements they make. Um, but you know, we definitely get the, the the phone call when you you know you talk to one counsel and they ask for one thing, you know, can we have an extension of this or can we have that? And then I swear, like. In, you know, 30 minutes later, the other defense counsel calls up and asks for the exact same thing. Um, and so, but I would say that overall, to the extent that it impacts our investigation because people are coordinating testimony, um, and you can tell when they're coordinating testimony, um, when they're coordinating testimony responses among their clients, that's problematic and, and that we take into consideration at the end of the case. Okay, and Wilson, how about from your in-house perspective? How important is it for you to have a common interest type agreement with counsel for your employees? I'm acutely aware that I'm sitting next to Tracy right now. <laughs> um, you but can move over a little bit if you want. <laughs> in the abstract, all things being equal, I think joint defense agreements or common interest agreements are useful. Um, that said, I think uh, it's incumbent upon the company to either withdraw or to not engage in them at all once, once there is some inkling that there is an adversity of interest. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I think if, if it can be applied in good faith, then by all means, it should be pursued. It's useful. OK. Um, we're coming up on the end of our presentation, so I want to jump to another topic. 
um, a lot of the companies in this area, this geography, are relatively small and relatively young, even though they might be publicly traded companies. Does the SEC, how do you take into account the resource differential between a very large global company and a smaller, albeit public company? And what do you do to, to try to recognize that they don't have the same 50 people on the ground the next day in their Ferraris that Phil can bring? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so there are so a number of, of different you know, options, right? So we, we do have clawback agreements, right, which allow um, companies to produce documents without doing a privilege review, um, which saves the company's resources from having to review all these documents in advance. So we have clawback agreements. We also can work with them to prioritize certain um, documents, right? So because during an investigation, we don't know whether there's wrongdoing or not. So we will say prioritize these documents um, from these individuals. We'll review those, and then we'll, um, and then we'll consider you know, from there you know, next steps, uh, who we want to talk to, additional documents. Uh, but we can work with them to, to sort of prioritize information. And I think those are two of the things that we really do. But we absolutely understand that, that you have small companies that, that don't have, you know, the resources to expend on you know, outside counsel, mm -hmm. um, like, like bigger companies will. OK, well, I think we're at the, at the hour. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> Very much appreciate it. We could have talked all day about this, this particular topic, but yeah. we'll stop now. Thank you. All right, that's our last panel for the day. Uh, you do us a great job, everybody. Um, great way to wrap the event up. So just quickly, let me thank the 27 world-class consulting and law firms that were represented here today as sponsors and supporters of this event. And thank you to all the panelists uh, and to everybody for being with us here today. For those of you who are here virtually, uh, we hope you'll join us again at a future event. And for those of you who are here in person, we've got one more thing to do. We have a cocktail party right out these doors. So please join us and uh, hope you had a good day. Thank you. <laughs>